Great. Thank you so much, Craig. And um, thank you all for, for joining the talk. And um, I see there's, there's really a lot of very um, senior geologists um, on, the, on this uh, talk. So I actually sort of um, created the presentation with more, more juniors in mind, but um, considering everybody has shown up to listen to both myself and Bakiwe, I hope that uh, there's something that you can take away from, from my talk at least, um, even if it is just CPD points. So let me start, uh, let me try and start. Uh, there we go. So um, just as a brief introduction, um, I, my background is, is exploration geology and um, I really cut my teeth predominantly in, oh, let me just get my pointer, uh, laser pointer, there we go. Um, so I, I really cut my teeth in the exploration field within Mozambique and I spent the, the first few years um, learning the fundamentals and the, the foundation within Mozambique. But since then I've had a lot of exposure to a lot of different commodities and um, I've really just enjoyed absolutely everything that I've done in my career. And that's, that's really what I wanted to do was, was share it with the GSSA. And, um, oh, and thank you to Nolene and Craig and the GSSA for inviting me to, to be part of it. So like I said, um, you know, I had designed this, this whole uh, presentation predominantly for, for the younger, um, younger ge uh, geosciences or geoscientists rather. Um, so I hope, uh, sorry, I must just hide my thumbnail because it was dancing all over my um, my presentation. And um, so I, I really went and put together just sort of a brief um, workflow that I've been through with my projects and generally what people go through with their exploration projects and um, how you bring a project to, to market. So the, the first thing that um, we or I did, and generally a generic project does in, in general, is your literature and desktop study where you go and you identify a suitable region and all of its um, geological uh, influence around that, that area that you're interested in. And that was what we started off with. And my first job, uh, if it will allow me, so Craig's given me also the, the host's um, I'm also a co-host, so it's, it's just a bit delayed with allowing me to, to do access on my uh, presentation, so apologies for that. In any case, uh, my first project that I, I ever started on was the, the Save River Alluvial Diamond Project, which is seated over here, just to the west of uh, Mozambique, bordering Zim. And um, this really did all start with the desktop theory and that um, there was diamonds here in the highlands of the Marangi fields that then traveled down the um, Suave River and then entered down to um, the project location that we were looking at. And um, the theory was that there was a change in gradients and where our project was based over here, that's where the um, the, the river would have dumped all of its alluvials and diamonds. So that was really our theory and our desktop studies. And this is where we then started our project. So um, geologically, we were after the gravels. And so we looked at different terraces and we focused on this region as this alluvial project that you can see. And we went and we mapped it and went to go and see all the different um, terraces that had formed and, and areas that we could target. And, and this was sort of the initial mapping that we had done on the project. So unfortunately, you, we, we didn't get very far because as we carried on prospecting, we, we did eight trial pits. Um, with regards to an alluvial project, you can't do assays because you're looking for diamonds and the um, homogeneity is, is not too consistent. So um, we instead, you do all in most alluvial projects, uh, at least diamond alluvial projects, you'll do trial sampling, uh, which we used a barrel screen over here. And then it went into two uh, 16 foot pans, which we then took this concentrate into a feed bin. And then we used two jigs or two, to the, the size fractions for us to then go and throw the uh, concentrate was left behind within these jigs onto a sorting table. And then we used to sort through the concentrate. Um, unfortunately, the, the actual economics of the project didn't allow for us as, as expats and the, the size of the project to run. So we did find diamonds, but economically it wasn't able to um, sustain the expenses that we went through as an exploration company. So that was really sort of the beginning part of that I had experienced was the um, desktop study that we had gone into. Then 
The second um, study as a, as a generic sort of um, exploration project, you would go into GIS regional and target selection. And um, here you would look at historical mineral um, occurrences, abandoned mines, we, you would see if you could find any remote sensing um, regarding economic deposits in the area, um, as well as any regional radiometrics, as well as magnetics, and then obviously any geochemistry that you can find within the area that would be able to help you uh, develop your project further. And with that, um, I was exposed to another project being the, the graphite um, in Mozambique up here in Montepoish. And that was really the, our, our start of our project was again, doing a desktop study and then looking at all forms of, of GIS that we could and um, any historical information we could find to develop the project further. So um, initially how we started is we looked at what um, other projects we, we knew about in the area. The one being um, Metals of Africa being this, you know, aqua blue color, they um, indicated uh, mineral potential. And then Syra, which is also very well known, which is this, oh no, sorry, Syra over here is the green, um, also a very, very well known um, deposit. So the company that I worked for had these red tenements that were uh, red, what am I saying? These black tenements over here. And so that's what we went to go and look for is what historical information, oh, sorry. Um, there's just, sorry, Joel, your, um, let me just mute you. There we go. Because you're throwing me off a bit there. All righty. So what we did was we went to go and walk lines, EM lines, geophysics lines, perpendicular to the strike to see if that we were able to find any uh, mineralization that we could then further validate. So we did. And I don't know if I, oh no, I didn't put a, an image in here. Um, but we did. And we did find... Um, a kick in our geophysics. So in order for us to validate that mineralization, we went and we did some RC drilling and found um, graphite within the schists. And um, here you can see it was um, the, the values that we were finding were around 17% TGC, which is our total graphitic carbon, which was enough uh, evidence and I suppose enough excitement to, to provide to our investors. And they were then able to um, or our, our funders were then able to, to raise enough money so that we could fly SkyTeam over the, the areas of interest so that we could then further go and drill with um, a bit of geophysics to, to guide us. So then that would lead us up to the, the targeted field work and then um, following up with, with the different uh, techniques that you can use within exploration. And what we specifically did within this project was we ranked the 10 known um, uh, um, uh, anomalies, we, we ranked them. And so what we then did was we did some drilling with RC just to get a, a confirmation that these um, anomalous that we, were, that we found were graphite bearing. And when we went to go and test them, um, eight of the 10 anomalies were um, graphitic bearing. And what was really interesting is even though the anomaly um, 001 which we thought from a geophysical point of view was going to be the, the most um, uh, affluent. We went, actually what the best one that we found was MORC4. Um, so um, we were then able to go and do, uh, so we then followed this up with some um, diamond drilling and the difference between the diamond drilling and the RC drilling is, the RC drilling is quick, but an inexpensive technique. So we used it to really just to prove concept of mineralization. The problem is, is it's quite destructive. And with graphite, you're looking for um, the larger flake size. So with the destructive method, you would obviously be skewing your results. So what we did was we then drilled the three highest ranking um, total graphitic carbon averages of the, the RC boreholes with diamond holes so that we could then go further and test the, the metallurgical properties. So really this over here was the, the Kaula resource that we found, the really one of the smallest um, of the areas that of the tenements that we owned and the, the actual owner of the property almost gave the, the, re, the actual um, boundary away 
because we before he had known how lucrative it was and, and only once we had then done all this follow-up work were we then able to see how important it was that um, we had developed it correctly so that we didn't go and give away our highest uh, grade graphite deposit, which you can really see down here how, how rich in graphite it is. And um, yes, as you can see in the historical, what I was trying to explain, I, I don't think very clearly, is um, the, the green area is the Shiano complex, which is known for its um, graphite bearing properties. And as you can see on this concession, it's just a minor amount. And so the owner was very tempted to give it away because he was paying for this whole region with only that amount of, of graphite on. But it actually really turned out to be one of the best concessions that the, the company held. And um, it was really beneficial that we, we, he did keep on to it. Um, just some, some brief um, updates or, or um, explanations regarding the work that we did. We then went and we drilled orientated core boreholes at an incline. And um, we were able to see that the graphite uh, fitted within a, a reclined isoclinal fold structure, um, which was roughly dipping, as you can see here, about 60 degrees towards the west. Um, we were able to um, declare a mineral resource of 2.1 million tons at an average grade of 13%, with the cutoff grade being 8%. And um, then the, the really nice part was it also had a byproduct of vanadium pentoxide um, running at 22 million tons at a 0.3% cutoff. So it was really quite a lucrative project. Uh, this is really just a bit of a summary of the work that was done and um, all the different exploration techniques that, that followed up with this. And then um, the last sort of step with regards to the exploration work that I've done is then I've, I have already touched on it, the, the um, drilling, but um, you can also do auger drilling as well, not only simply um, RC and diamond drilling. And actually there's a whole host of, of additional drilling methods that you can um, use and utilize, which um, is really interesting and, and all have their benefits and pros and cons, but I've, I've really gone for the, the most generic and most frequently used that um, as a junior, I think that you would be exposed to if you were in an exploration position. And um, with, the, with the RC, I've already explained the RC and um, the, the diamond drilling techniques, but with the auger drilling, it's predominantly for shallow depth and for targeting um, unconsolidated sediments. So any sort of free dig um, deposit that you're looking for, this would really be the, the tool that you're looking for predominantly with regards to your, your sedimentary or your secondary deposits. And um, where I was exposed to, to auger drilling was on the, the Montepoise Ruby deposit that I worked on. And where I was very fortunate is that during the, uh, I think now, during the winter when there was no water, we used to go and drill at the Kaula deposit. And very close, we also then had the Ruby deposit, the Montepoise Ruby deposit, which we would then go and focus on in the summer because we had the rains to run our processing plants. And also the other positive was is that your, your rigs and your uh, vehicles and, and all your logistics don't get stuck in the mud because when it rains, there's um, some serious amounts of rain that, that really creates a, a lot of trouble with your logistics. Um, so just a quick uh, bit of information regarding the, the Montepoise Ruby deposit that's, that I worked on. Um, we excavated a number of trial pits as well as uh, there's a, a large trial pit with our excavator in um, the, one of these large pits. We also then, here's me in one of the, um, this, sorry, there has me in one of the um, hand dug pits that we would then go into and dig to a certain depth, um, normally about a meter so that we could track then this gravel that we were after. And here you can see a really large um, um, lens of, of gravels that was more of a colluvium than anything else that we were then targeting. Um, roughly with regards to the, the trial pits, these eight trial pits that we went through, um, we, we roughly watched about 200,000 tons of gravel. And um, from that, we, we were able to recover 74,000 carats. So the average grade was at 0.35 um, carats per ton. Uh, once again, just a bit of an overview of the, the Montepoise Ruby deposit that I worked on, um, that it was based on a colluvial gravel. Um, its primary source, um, we, we, it was not our target. And on the property that we were based on, we never found it. But um, we were 
predominantly after the, the secondaries. And um, the different exploration techniques that we went through was the auger drilling, pitting, and bulk sampling. And here's a, an example of um, our auger drilling. And oh, here's, here was my, my home for about five years, going between the rubies and, and the, the graphite projects. Um, and Martins, our dog, and Mirarai, our driver. Um, and then here's our processing plants that, that went, our, our rubies went through again. Very similar setup to the, the diamonds. Apologies, my phone is now making a noise. Um, a very similar setup to our diamonds, um, our diamond processing plant where we had a scrubber that it went through and then went into two um, 16 foot pans and then up to a concentrator where we would then, or not myself, but the, um, the picking team would then pick up the, the rubies through um, the, the material that had, had been concentrated. So I, I did rush through that a bit because I could see from my um, audience that it was predominantly, like I say, um, experienced years that, that were joining the talk. Um, and what I went to go and find out for, which uh, hopefully, you know, this is of a bit of interest from for, for the more experienced years that are on the call, um, is that there's a definite trend within the, the exploration. What we're seeing is that there is a decrease in um, large projects that are being found. And as you can see here, which I've highlighted, initially in 2020, only uh, 52 uh, maiden or initial resources were recorded, which has been at an all-time year low, um, keeping in mind that, that 2020 was a COVID year. So, so that does you know, add additional challenges. Um, but it is quite a, a change from the 175 deposits which were um, this discovered and, and um, uh, released in 2012. So it is quite a, a difference. And uh, another point is that in 2012, um, grassroots exploration was a third of um, exploration budgets, whereas now it, it's being spent on predominantly more brownfields or less risky projects, which for me is, is quite sad. And, and as you can see here, the majors are dominating the um, exploration playing field and are putting a lot more money into the, the um, projects than the intermediates or, or junior companies. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, there is just a, a major discoveries are on the downtrend. And um, the, the research shows that the majority of countries or companies rather are changing its focus from an early stage asset exploration to a rather a advanced mine sites uh, challenge. So that, that's what we're currently doing. So and another point that we can see is that during the down, um, downturns, the finding deposits is, is much less, but that is to be expected because the, the money isn't as readily available. Another point that, that's been mentioned is that juniors are definitely opting to spend money on less risky projects and not so much on the green stage, early st or green uh, grassroots and, and early stage explorations uh, projects, whereas majors are generally maximizing their value and spending their money on existing mines with, with a very small budget going into um, exploration. So just to, to, to add, you know, while explorers remain risk averse, large scale grassroots programs are far more difficult to conduct in 2020 than um, the concentrated mines were. So again, with, with COVID, it made it a lot more difficult. And, and that is possibly one of the reasons we're seeing um, a, a downward trend. And hopefully, you know, there is a, a trend that, that's gonna start moving upwards and speaking to a lot of people in the industry, they, they all seem to believe that we're going to start hitting a, a bit of an upward uh, trend, which would be really great for all of us. Just very briefly, the exploration in Africa, as you can see over here with the annual budgets, which was released in 2019 by S&P Global, Latin America is leading by far. Um, and then with Africa being one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, five. So yeah, they, they are fifth um, with regards to, to the money that is being spent. And when I was in varsity, um, you know, we were always told that Africa was the bride that everyone's trying to court. Um, however, now it seems that we, we have lost favor to Latin America. Having said that, however, we do still have um, interest in, in our continents in general. And um, according to the 1920 at nine, uh, 2019 figures, um, the DRC, Burkina Faso and Ghana were the three countries leading um, with, with the amounts that are being spent on exploration within the, the continent. And what was interestingly enough, I, I haven't added this, but South Africa was actually fourth 
which is great news for us as South Africans that, that there is still interest that at least in 2019, money was still being put into exploration. So um, a bit of a concluding slide. Um, being an exploration geologist, you work extremely long hours and in extreme conditions, both in the heat and, and the cold. And um, for me personally, I always get quite filthy and you don't have the luxury of deciding where your project is based. But the, bit, the, the great thing is, is that exploration takes you to all these unexpected and remote areas that, that there's a lot of people who don't get the opportunity to do it. So why exploration? Um, for me, I, I really, I love it. I, I find it rewarding and that data collection helps you make informed decisions. And often, you know, you are at the make or break points when it comes to deciding on how to move forward with the project. Had such a great uh, memories and, and experiences. Here I am crossing the, the mighty Limpopo on this little raft. Um, I've got to do great things and meet wonderful people. Um, so that's why for me, I love exploration. Then um, just in regards to, again, um, speaking to, to the geosciences and, and the career of, of being a, a geoscientist, um, you know, why am I here? I, I really feel that the future of geoscience is education, and which is why I wanted to share my experiences and, and encourage the younger generation to, to get involved and, and be passionate about what they're doing and what they're studying. Um, as I mentioned, it's becoming more and more difficult for um, companies to bring on great deposits. And a lot of reports say that what's keeping our industry going is, is mainly mature minds. So in order for us to, to get more world deposits, we really need world-class um, geoscientists to, to find world-class deposits. Um, another point is that the, um, there is a growing skills, ja a skills gap with a skill shortage and um, collaboration between all disciplines and all um, different ages is really key to finding all the different opportunities and our industry really needs it. So I really feel that outreach is really the most important. Um, it's more important now than, it, than it's ever been. Thanks to, to GSSA for this initiative and that they are really devoted to advancing um, geoscience, the discovery and the responsible development of, of mineral resources. So. That's me.